Church, welcome. We are delighted to have you join us tonight. Hope you all have your brawny shirts on. It's kind of cold out there. Uh, we're going to pray some for those folk who don't have heat and power yet, and we're going to uh, take a look at Revelation chapter 4 and spend some time in prayer. But let's bow our heads and invite Jesus to be present. Heavenly Father, our thanks, our praise to you. We lift our hands in worship and invite you to come and sit with us this night. Teach us. Raise our voices in song. Join with us and fill us with the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join with us in song. I know it feels funny to sit there and sing by yourself, but hey, we'll get over it. The Lord will love it.
Praise the Lord. Great hymns of praise. We're going to uh, reset some things here, and then we're going to take some time to pray. Lots and lots of things to pray about. There are people that are still without power, people that are, have water lines frozen, uh, the, the list just cars that won't start. The list goes on and on and on. We want to pray for protection. Uh, we don't usually get 18, 19 degrees below zero here, but it does happen. And, uh, and we have people who are suffering as a result. We want to hold them up, as well as all of the other concerns that we have for the Lord. So let's bow our heads. O oh Lord God Almighty, you know the ins and the outs of the weather. You are the one who moves the stars and the sun and the earth in their courses. You're the one who guides the clouds and sends the storms. And, and we thank you and we praise you for the snow and for, for the uh, fact that our weather does change. Without it, we would not have a pleasant life. Lord, we do earnestly pray that you would help those who are struggling this night. Uh, it took our house 24 hours to warm back up. And there are those who still don't have electricity, those who have water frozen, those who have wells that are not pumping. 
oh Lord, these people suffer. And we do pray that your comfort, that your peace that passes all understanding would fall upon them, that they would find the help that they need, and that Lord Jesus, you would give us comfort as this cold weather passes and we warm back up to average temperatures. Thanks and praise to you for you provide for us. You alone can keep us in your hands and hold us in your peace that passes all understanding. Jesus, there are families that are grieving, that have lost loved ones in the last couple of weeks. There are families who are going through dramatic changes with moving and, and with finding smaller home settings as they age. There are those that are struggling with illness and uh, family members that, that are troubled by the things that they see happening with their older family members. Jesus, comfort these people. Give them your strength. Give them your peace that passes all understanding. Show them your love and your kindness, O oh Lord. And Jesus, we earnestly pray for those who have been sick, those who have viruses and colds and flu and, and COVID. Jesus, help. Pour down your loving kindness. Help, Lord, help. That we might know your comfort and your strength and that we might give you praise and glory. Earnestly, Jesus, we pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit out on this land. That from the President and the Congress and the Senate down to the governors and the state legislatures and the city councils and mayors and county superintendents, that these people, Lord, are, are there to shape our lives and to help us live in peace. And yet they do troubling things. And we pray that you would wake them up tomorrow morning, that you would create a hunger in their heart, that they would desire you and your kingdom and your righteousness, that they would seek your word and your favor, and the decisions that they make would be guided by you. Oh, Lord, we do ask for the fullness of the power of the presence of your Holy Spirit to be, to be poured out on, on Waterville and on Douglas County and on Washington State and on our nation. You, Lord, are the author of revival. You, Lord, are the only one who can, who can bring deliverance and bring the peace that passes all understanding to us and to Israel and to Gaza and to the Ukraine and to the rest of the world. Into the ages, Jesus, you have made promises and we stand on those promises. We ask, O oh Lord, that this night, as we study from Revelation 4, that you would teach us, that you would open our minds and our hearts, that you would help us to understand deep and dark truths that are found in those passages in the book of Revelation. And Lord, we do hold up to you our, our emergency responders, our EMTs, our fire department, our police protection. Jesus, these people lay their lives down to provide a, a good life for us. In the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit, bless them, protect them, lift them up. And Jesus, keep us from cars that seem to want to stop in this cold weather and leave us stranded. Protect us. We ask these things that Jesus might be glorified. Amen. So tonight we're looking at Revelation chapter 4. Actually, Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5 are actually one piece, and they should have not been two chapters. But when Bishop Unser divided the Bible up into passages, um, he did as he felt best, and we are really stuck with his plan because it's been dozens and dozens if not hundreds of years that we have of commentaries and and books and bibles that are all laid out according to this so let's read chapter four this is the first half of what is said in this passage after these things i looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which i had heard 
like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning, sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had the face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them having six wings, and are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. So the old salty kids program from the early 1980s sang a song that went like this, Heaven is a beautiful place full of filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. But I have a feeling that John would have sung that song like this. Heaven is a scary place with eyes searching all over the place. Yeah. John, John's saw things, experienced things that we, we say we want to see and we want to experience, but they're scary things. He was a man in the flesh still. An old man, but a man in the flesh. And here he was standing in the presence of Almighty God. Revelation 4 just may not be our vision of what heaven is really like, but it is the vision of heaven that John actually saw. He was there. He stood at the door of the throne room of God. And he witnessed all the things in that, in that room that were going on and happening and, and all of the creatures and the worship that took place. And it is a wonderful place. It really is. But it is filled with all the power and the glory and all of the terror of, of the one who cast a molten ball into the sky called the sun. God has incredible power. And the worship in heaven reflects that, reflects his nature, reflects who he is in relation to us. And we are deeply responsible for worshiping him with humility. The interpretive theory of the second coming that, of Jesus, known as dispensationalism, or sometimes as premillennialism, they're really almost the same thing, presents the Left Behind series that you have seen in books and television programs and movies and as visually convincing. I mean, they really make it feel like this is the way the end of time is going to happen. But it's a misguided interpretation of Revelation chapter 4. It, re it really is misguided. It really is wrong. 
and I can show you more ways than, than it's wrong, but I'm going to show you the way that it's wrong here in this passage. You see, they claim the open door that John saw and the command for him to come up is, is what they call the rapture of the church. You see, he came up to the throne of God and watched the proceedings that took place in Revelation 4, and, and that supposedly is our rapture out of this world and our deliverance from all of the evil and all of the harm of the world and from Satan and his forces of darkness. And we're just going to have a happy life in heaven after that point. However, John does not step through that door. He's invited up to the door. He sees what's happening in the throne of, room of God. He reports the things and the events that took place up there. But he wasn't in there, and he wasn't worshiping there, and he wasn't, literally was not involved in the events there. He was there as a witness, so he could tell us what's going to happen next, which has to do with chapter 5. And so he's, he's really preparing us for what's happening in chapter 5, and, and a person cannot make this connection that they claim in chapter 4. They really can't. There are other reasons, too. For example, uh, Paul wrote that the rapture of the church, if you want to call it that, the, the taking up into heaven of the church to meet Jesus in the air, happens at the last trumpet. And there are seven of them in the book of Revelation, and the last one doesn't happen until all kinds of horrible things happen. So it's just not true. You see, John is an observer, not a, not a participant. And he, and he literally is describing to us proceedings of a royal court, literally. That's what's being described for us in this passage. When we are transformed, we become participants in what's going on in the, around the throne of God. We worship and, and we join in with that worship and we, and we become part of all of the events there. And John didn't. John was there to tell us what was happening. And literally, this is the official beginning, the, the start of the judgment of God that he's witnessing here in this passage. And that word rapture, it's not in Scripture. It's, it's a coined word that we use to describe what it is that's going to happen when Jesus returns. And it's wrongly understood. When we put our transformation in this spot, we miss a lot of things and misunderstand a lot of things and misinterpret a lot of things that happen in the rest of the book of Revelation because it's placed wrongly. I want to believe that the rapture takes place here. Who doesn't? We don't want to face all the awful stuff that Revelation talks about in chapter 6 and following. We want to avoid those things. We want to turn, us, we want to turn aside at this moment. And, and no one wants judgment to happen. No one wants to see the awful things that take place with Satan and the Antichrist. But you see, this is another part of the sweet tea American Christian view of Christianity where everything in life is good and all roses and God is, never has a grump on, never, because he's, he's, he's a loving God, right? Well, Jesus has a grump on, and pretty soon he just might show up, and he might show us that grump. Because he doesn't like the way we live. He doesn't like the things we do. But if you look at this passage and look at, look at what's happening within it, this is the formal proceeding where the Lord declares the beginning of judgment on the earth and all of the sin that is taking place here and all of the way that people are living. And, and it, is, it is an official proceeding where the power and the glory of God is recognized and identified. You see, Revelation 4 is that ceremony. And we need to see it as a ceremony. All the pomp and circumstance and worship that is appropriate to the event and the judgment begins when the Lamb of God in chapter 5 
opens the seals or starts opening the seals to that book that was held up and no one could be found to open except the lamb that was slain. Two lifetimes ago, and the only reason I share this is so that I can make this clear. Two lifetimes ago, I studied Greek, yeah. I had a year of it in college and I had two years of it in seminary. For my final project in seminary, I translated the book of Revelation from Greek into English. And so, yeah, I know a couple of things about this book. And I share this because I come to this book knowing what it really says. Not what somebody says it says, but what it really says. And I can tell you with great certainty that this scene in heaven is, a, is about the second, not about the second coming rapture, as some claim, but it's really about the recognition and identification of God and the Lamb who has the power to break the seals and disclose what's happening. And so this is the, the beginning of a proceeding and the beginning of the launching of judgment upon the earth. That's what chapters 4 and 5 are about. John is ordered to come up to this open door. And from that door, he observes the dramatic worship and witnesses all of the stuff that goes on with this scene without entering in. There's no evidence that he entered in. He came and he looked and he beheld, there's that powerful word again, where you're supposed to really see something and wow, this is really big. And then there was a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which he heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with him, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things that's pretty clear but you see he saw our creator sitting on the throne looking like jasper and sardis i don't know about you that brown picture is jasper it's not the vision i have of god it's not how i see him i think of him as a person sitting there looking like you and i that looks more like snakeskin it, it really does. It, Jasper is all mottled and full of browns and, and whites and tans. And, and he also looks like Sardis. So he has, he has a crimson color mixed in that's, that's striped and, and has various colors in it. And so here's God sitting on his throne looking like that brown and looking like that red. And, and John is probably just as shocked as I am at that idea. Because the fact is, it's not how I thought God would look. But this is what John saw. And an emerald rainbow circled the throne. You know, so there was this arch, this rainbow, a bow, over the throne of God. But it was green and, and multicolored green and shiny and I think of a rainbow as red and blue and green and yellow and orange and purple. No. Over the throne of God, it's green. You know, so, so it's a declaration of his creative power and his glory, a declaration of the power of his presence and, and of his uniqueness, apart from anything we can think or imagine. And so, yes, he has kind of a mottled brown look to him, and he kind of has a red look to him, and he kind of has this green arch over his head. And there he sits. But that's just, that's just the way he looked. There's so much more going on here. These things struck John in a way that required John to record all of this. It required writing it down. It required describing to us. Now, maybe maybe we're told that he's all brown mottled colored like that with red so that we're not shocked. <laughs> I don't know. But it's a sure different view of God than I had. I can't speak for you. 
But in my mind, God does not look like Jasper or Sardis. He, he just doesn't. And rainbows are all t different colors, not shiny green. But look at this. This is why, this is, this is the what and the why of this scene in heaven. This is a formal occasion, and we're seeing God on his throne in a formal event where he is identified, he is recognized, he is he has declared who he is out of the throne or flashes of lightning that, that spark out from him and sounds and peals of thunder. And there are seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And those are described over there. If you go back to Revelation 1, you can find a description of those lampstands. And they are the seven spirits of God. Now, wait a minute. God has the Holy Spirit. What are these seven spirits all about? Seven spirits are all about angels that are sent to, how many continents are there? There are seven spirits sent out into the world to watch over the world. And there are seven continents for those spirits to watch over. And here they are, they are not out watching over. They are standing in the presence of God in this passage. They are before the throne. And before the throne is a sea of glass, like crystal, like crystal clear glass. And in the center and around the throne are, are the guards, the four living creatures that stand in the presence of God. Why all of this? Because this is a formal meeting of God with all of his created beings about the end of the world. And eventually, when we get down to chapter 5, this little book is going to be handed over to Jesus, and he's going to be the only one, the only one who can open that book. You see, he saw the Lord seated on his throne, and he saw 24 elders on thrones dressed in white with gold crowns on their head surrounding the throne of God. Now, wait a minute. These are people. You know, notice... Notice the elders are redeemed and transformed people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and all of the other prophets or, or the righteous leaders like David. And see how they are seated around the throne of God. They are in an official position and there for an official purpose and they are sitting you know, we worship God. We throw ourselves before his face and we, we sing hymns of praise to him and we raise our hands. They're sitting because this is a formal proceeding. And God is being declared as the one who, who is holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty, the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And the four living creatures are guarding him and the elders are surrounding him. And the seven spirits are standing there with their flames of fire who watch over the seven continents of the earth. Yeah. Where do you see anything like that in this world? You see, all of this takes place on a sea of crystal with royal guards and with all of the pomp and the circumstance and, and all of the, the heavy duty important beings and people kind of gets scary at this point it really does you see cherubim like gabriel are not cute little babies peeking over a cloud and and smiling with little wings going like this they don't have winsome looks on their face they are incredible powerful beings they have six wings one of them has the face of a cow one of the, or a calf and one of them has the face of an eagle and one of them has the face of a lion and one of them has the face of a man and they are full of eyes everywhere talk about being creeped out yeah these guys have eyes everywhere all the way around them and Gabriel is a cherubim and Satan was also a cherubim. But you see here they cover every inch of their body with eyes and animal faces and, and 
six wings and they're full of, we're told in other passages in Ezekiel, are full of burning fire. Just don't ever forget that Lucifer was one of them before he rebelled against God. And he is also very powerful. He may have been kicked out of heaven. He may not be part of this righteous group. But he sure knows how it works. And he sure has power to deal with us. The cherubim do not cease crying out to the creator. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who is and who was and who is to come. He's past, present, present and future. He's eternal. And this declaration decides his character and, and his purpose in this scene. Because this is a formal scene. And this is where the elders actually get involved. Instead of just sitting there as representatives, they are now on their faces and they're throwing their crowns at the feet of God and say in worship, and they are declaring his glory along with the, the creatures and along with the seven lampstands and along with the throng of angels that are sen standing around waiting for their assignments. Worthy are you, Lord our God. Worthy are you to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will, by your will, they existed, and they were created. Wow. Now, wait a minute. This is, just, this is just the opening ceremony. This is just the opening ceremony. This is the beginning of the end of times, and it's the point at which God has this meeting with the elders and with the angels and with the seraphim and with the cherubim and with the elders and a book is handed out in chapter 5 that only Jesus can open because he alone is worthy of pronouncing judgment on this earth and he begins to pronounce judgment in chapter 5 we'll talk about that next week we are fascinated by fancy robes and medallions and pomp and ceremony of England's royal family uh, when, when King Charles was, was crowned as king of the kingdom. He had his scepter, he had his robe, he had all of his royal family around him and all of the chancellors and, and, and all of the lords and ladies and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all of their fancy, fancy get up. But did you know their idea came out of Revelation chapter 4? Doing that came out of Revelation. They see what's in here, and they're replicating what it is that's happening in heaven because the authority of the king is pronounced, and the authority of the king is, is displayed in all of its manifold glory, and he takes his seat on the throne, and all of the ruling class are surrounding him, just like in this scene right here. You see, seeing this for what it is, an opening ceremony kind of erases the idea that this is the rapture of the church. And, and it really sets for us the real purpose. The real purpose is so that Jesus is released to pronounce judgment on the earth for sin. And he alone is worthy of that, of that job because he paid the price. For sin and the world keeps rebelling against him the real purpose of the scene is is the righteous worth of the Lamb of God slain for us on the cross for our sins and the fact that he alone is worthy to open that book that pronounces judgment and releases condemnation on the earth we see all of this in chapter 5 the rest of the book is about what happens when Jesus breaks each seal and, and the judgment that then comes upon the sinful rebellion of humankind as a result of that. We have received the judgment on sinful rebellion on the cross of Calvary when Jesus poured out his life and his blood for our sins. Yeah. 
we've received that judgment. But the earth has to go through all of the other judgments, and we will watch that happen. Not because we're evil, but rather because the judgment is on humankind in total, not just upon the sinful and rebellious, but on earth and the things we've done to the earth and the way we've behaved and the way we've lived. And so that we are ready for his return in glory because we have been cleansed and we have stood righteously before him. We need to believe and just live like we believe. In light of this passage, our lives need to change. Let's pray. God Almighty, King of the universe, wash over us, teach us, raise us, us up so that we can see the manifest glory and the power of your hand at work in our lives in our world help us lord to see you as on your throne in your power and your glory and ready to hand that book to jesus oh lord we say maranatha come lord jesus but that also means terror on earth And we pray for your peace that passes all understanding. May you be blessed this week. We'll talk about chapter 5 and Jesus as the Lamb next week. Have a great week.